speaker, grew up wealthy, and then came over to the United States not so wealthy, with a firm resolve that he would, again, be quite wealthy. And he took on the prospect of achieving this as a battle. And he now has $5 billion under management. But he also sees a different kind of economic warfare, a warfare between those who produce and those who take. Hence the title of his book, Economic Welfare. Warfare. <laughs> economic Warfare. So, please welcome the author of Economic Warfare, Ziad Abdelnour. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for the Atlas Society. Thank you all for being here. I'm not going to bore you with details. I don't do speeches. I don't have a PowerPoint. I don't have a script. It comes from experience. It comes from the heart. It comes from the gut. And I believe in instincts. That's how I conduct business. It's all about people. Uh, First, I've always been a fan of Ayn Rand. I've read Atlas Shrugged and a number of her other books three, four times. And, you know, I just realized how far-reaching the message is and has become, despite the fact that she wrote the book in a time and age where there was no internet, no media that we have today, Nothing like that. I, I, I said to myself one day, I just hope we could clone this woman <laughs> and create more people like that. So I'm a big fan of her. The book I wrote, Economic Warfare, look, I'm not an academic, I'm not a politician, I'm not running for any office, I'm not interested in because I seek my privacy. I'm a very private man. And I'm a businessman. The reason I wrote this book is it's pretty much like Atlas Shrugged. It's a modern Atlas Shrugged applied to today's business world. This is a, not a fiction book. This is a hardcore, in your face, truth and facts of what's happening uh, today in the economy. And most importantly, lots of books have written about the crisis and about the problems and about the issues and bitching about this and that. No, no. I wanted to write a book that provides solutions of how to create obscene wealth in today's day and age. Because the biggest revenge you're going to have or you're going to face against the progressive the government, the establishment, the people out there who want to clip your wings is to create obscene wealth and outsmart them. The more you do that, the more you piss them off. And the happier you become. And the more empowered you become, your family becomes, and the more independent-minded you are. Think about it. If you have $10 in your pocket, you can't do nothing. You're just going to have to listen to this master of the universe or this other one in the government or in politics. When you, have, when you start making millions, and I'll tell you how, and you do that, you now start depend, uh, developing a mind of your own. The thing about money is not how many cars and planes and toys you have. Money for me means one thing is the freedom to do whatever you want, whenever you want, and you don't give a, uh, you know, a rat's ass about what other people say. You don't care. 
what the president is going to say, what Romney is going to say, what the government is going to say, what this is going to say. You have enough clout and resources to do what you want and to empower the world. It's freedom. It is exactly freedom. It's the ultimate freedom. Now, some people may have more billions than you or I or anyone, but they're not free because they are trying to rely or have an agenda or following this group or that group. You're gonna have to be free. And to be free in today's day and age, you have to create wealth. And to create wealth, you're gonna have to do your homework, real due diligence, and stop relying on all those egomaniacs who think they know anything and they don't know nothing. People tell me, you know, all these big guys on Wall Street. I'm a Wall Street insider. I've been there for 30 years. I've been in the trenches. You know, from JP Morgan to Goldman Sachs, they're so smart, they're so big, they're so this. They're not. If they were so smart, the Goldman Sachs guys, they wouldn't have been bailed out at the tune of $5 billion. They have been bailed out. My company has not been bailed out. Who's smarter? All these guys have been bailed out, so they're not that smart. So stop listening to them. Stop listening to the mumbo jumbo they say. Stop listening, do your own due diligence. People today, unfortunately, spend more time buying a car, deciding on which car they're gonna buy, than giving millions of dollars to John Corzine, Bernie Madoff, or all these crooks to invest their money or to their broker, or to some brokerage firm, or to their banker, etc. This is insane. But it's a, real, it's a fact. So number one, there's a lot of things I want to talk about, so I'm going to try to be very uh, specific. But number one, you're going to have to focus. If you want to really follow the agenda of Ayn Rand, if you want to be free, if you want change in this country, if you want to change the government, you know what, going and talking and writing articles and writing books is good, but at the end of the day, it's the action that counts. And in my book, by the way, there's a cipher, a riddle, like the Da Vinci Code, like all the stuff. If you resolve the, the cipher, the riddle, and I'll tell you how by buying the book or going to the website, economic-warfare.com, you'll see what the call of action is to make a regime change in America. Literally, like they say regime change in Iraq, I'm talking about regime change in America. That's what we need. And we're not mincing our words here. We need regime change here. But it's not gonna happen unless you know exactly what you're talking about, unless you know exactly what the issues are, unless you go and act about it. Love the politicians. For example, give you an example. Today, everybody is debating from Congress to the Senate to the presidents, Romney or Obama. It's all about job creation. The government has to create more jobs. We create more jobs, everything will be fine. Well, in my honest opinion, they're all wrong. Because the government's job is not to create jobs. The government jobs is to create an environment that's conducive for wealth creation. That, in my opinion, should be the role of the government if we are to get out of the smiths. Give you an example. Today, we have five million plus millionaires in America. That's all. People with net worth of one million dollars and more. Assets, cash, whatever. I'd like to see a government Congressman, Senator, President, saying, my mandate over the next four to eight years is to create 20 million millionaires. What should the government do? What policy should they follow to create 20 million millionaires? How are we gonna brainstorm this and create 20 million millionaires? The private sector job is to create jobs, not the government. Look at how many millionaires were created by doing the IPO of Facebook. Lots of them. Or others. Google. Lots of them. And they're going to be 
many more. These millionaires are going to create more millionaires, are going to start their companies sooner or later, once they have the critical mass, and they're going to go forward. Success is about empowering people. Freedom is about creating wealth. These are the issues that should be addressed by the government, by the private sector, by business. They are not. They are all on the wrong track. In my personal opinion, they are on the wrong track. And they are getting bogged down with all these details that are useless and a total waste of time. More regulations, more bureaucracy, less competition, both the power and the money is in the hands of a fewer and fewer number of people, bailouts, bankruptcies. I mean, for example, you know, one small example in this country, Chapter 11. There is no country in the world where there was a Chapter 11 other than the United States. Chapter 11 is giving the chance for people, for idiots and incompetents, to stay in power and, and have a redo again and again. The problem today in the United States is that we have a, a capitalism with a safety net. Capitalism shouldn't have a safety net. They want to cap your upside, and if you screw up, they're going to bail you out. So people in power, they can make, take as many weeks as they want, they know they're going to be bailed out, and now they're going to cap your upside, because they think the government, they have a divine right to appropriate or distribute your wealth, which according to, to Ayn Rand, when she talks about wealth redistribution, the people who decide how they're going to distribute the wealth think that they own that wealth. The government thinks that this is their money, not yours. And they could redistribute it the way they want. To make a long story short, I don't believe in the capitalism with a safety net. You can make as much money as you want, or as you can, based on the research and the due diligence you do and the capabilities that you have. That's capitalism. The people, the great people who built this country, this nation, the robber barons of last century, Rockefeller, Morgan, Carnegie, that's how they were. Steve Jobs, Larry Allison, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, that's how they are. We need more people like that, bigger than life, who do their homework, who work hard, and who go create wealth. And nobody should tell them how they spend their money and how their money should be kept. On the other hand, all the hedge fund managers, all the Wall Street bankers, all the other banks, when they want to take undue risks, they screw up, they should be out of business. AIG, Citibank, Merrill Lynch, oh, if we didn't bail out, if we didn't, if, we bail, if we didn't bail out, nothing would have happened. We would not have had $16 trillion in debt. They used the band aid for someone who had a cancer. This is insanity. When you have cancer, you extract it. You have to hurt. Well, no American wants to be, get hurt. Oh, please don't hurt me. Americans just want to be entertained. I just want to have fun. <clears throat> They'll go to the movies, they watch a movie, Avatar, $2 billion box office, a movie which means nothing, and they pay $2 billion for that, for the box office. But you know what? Working too hard, I don't want to do that. No, it doesn't work like this. No safety net. When people know that if they screw up once and they're out, they're going to work much harder, they're going to do much harder diligence. They're going to become much more competitive, much more, much more intense, and they're going to be richer. That's the process of wealth creation. Very few people understand it. And those who do are academics. Look, who is the culprit in all this stuff? People keep asking me the question, who's the culprit? Is it Wall Street? Is it the government? Is it us, the people? Well, I believe the biggest culprit of all is the Federal Reserve. That should be either disbanded or at least intensively audited. The Federal Reserve has the power to print as much money as they want, 
to bail out any country, any bank, any government, anyone. They decide who the next president is going to be. If you think that there's going to be any difference between Obama and Romney, you are delusional because there's not going to be any difference. The power structure is still intact. The Federal Reserve is still there. Nothing will change. You can have 50 Republicans or Democrats for the next 200 years, 50 presidents. Nothing's going to happen. Why? The Fed, they control the money. They decide which president is going to be elected. If they want Obama to be elected, they manipulate the stock market, the bond market. Everybody feels optimistic. Obama is doing a good job. By the way, all these numbers, all of them manipulated. I don't believe in a conspiracy theory, please. I'm not a conspiracy guy. I'm a realistic guy. I'm a guy whose head is on his shoulders. I know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about conspiracy theory. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm a capitalist. I'm an American. I want this country to really stand up on its feet. I have no other agenda. I'm not running for office. I'm not interested in any of this crap. Frankly, if I tell you what I want as my legacy over the next 20, 30, 40 years, I want to create millionaires and billionaires. What a better legacy than that, if each one of us can think about that. Creating millionaires and billionaires who are activists. We're going to be the biggest nightmare for the government, US government. Uncontrollable. Who are these guys? We can't control them. They have all this money, they have all this power, they have all these resources. That's John Galt. On steroids. <laughs> I mean, this is what I'm talking about. And you know what? It can be done. It can be done. If you start thinking about yourself and about how you really empower yourself first, how you really do your so how you start challenging the authority. Today, unfortunately, I mean, when you really think about it, it's the age of diminished expectations. When I came to, to this country, which I love, 30 years ago, in 1982, I was the luckiest guy in the world. Reagan was in power, you know. Wall Street was just starting its bull market. The 80s, age of the leverage buyouts, junk bonds, empire building, hostile takeovers, people were bigger than life. You could dream whatever you want, you could do whatever you want. Today is the age of dimension, it's exactly the reverse. Today, kids graduate from college, they go to their dad, dad, thank God I have a job. Today we're thankful because we have a pathetic job. We're thankful. Whereby, you know, when you really think about these guys, instead of being thankful of, you know what, I want to build an empire. Today there's wealth bashing. If you talk about wealth creation or wealth building, you're a bad guy. You're a rotten apple. You're an evil Wall Street guy. They make you believe in that. There's nothing evil in creating wealth, in empowering people, in making money, in kicking the ass of the US government. <laughs> There's nothing evil. There's all good. But they make you think this is evil. Today is the age of the touchy-feely. Don't hurt this guy's feeling. You cannot say on Christmas, Merry Christmas, because you're being insensitive to the people who are non-Christian. What is this bunch of crap? <laughs> I mean, really, and you know what? People have been dumbed down today. All what they watch is, you know, America's Got Talent and dancing and singing and all this stuff and Avatar box office, two billion dollars on some shitty little movie, blue, blue characters. <laughs> I mean, what is this crap? <laughs> I mean, honestly, the other day, I mean, I, I was telling the story to someone. I was watching, by mistake, you know, I watched, you know, Fox and CNN and everything. I was turning the channel, like this. I said, America's got talent. And I saw this episode. This guy was having his nuts kicked by some people, his balls. And everybody, all the audience was clapping. This is a talent today. If we can weather somebody kicking you in your nuts, 
You have talent. This is insanity. I mean, how low have we stooped? This is today a talent? I'll come back. Americans want to be entertained. If it's not entertaining, it's boring. It's too much work. If this guy makes money, how does he make money? He must be doing something wrong. No! 99.9% are not doing anything wrong. There is always rotten apples. Of course there are. We have to change your attitude first and come back to the level whereby wealth creation is good for the sake of freedom. If you want to be free, let me tell you something. You're going to have to make money. Because without making money, you're never going to be free. They're going to find a way to manipulate your minds, your pocket, everything. When you're free, you're independent. And to be uh, wealthy, you're going to have to do your due diligence. And you're going to have to stop this reverence to the establishment. There's a huge reverence today. Donald Trump says this. Who is he, God? Or Buffett said that. So what? Challenge him. This is what my book is all about. I challenge the whole Wall Street establishment in economic warfare. If anyone on Wall Street would have written my book, he would be fired from his job the next day. Why I'm, fi I'm not fired? Because I'm my own boss. I created my own fortress. No one on Wall Street can fire me. And I can say whatever I want. And every one of us can say the same thing and can do the same thing. And can follow the idea. And this is what Ayn Rand's message is. Start becoming like this. Start being that man, that individual. Individualism. Objective. Challenging the system. Challenging the authority. Being a rebel. We grow up, we have to conform. Your parents tell you you have to conform, you have to be a nice guy. Your teacher tells you you have to conform. Your husband or wife, you have to conform. Your, your colleagues at work, you're too aggressive, Ziad, you're rocking the boat, you have to conform. You're now 40 years old, with a blink of an eye, 450 years old, you've conformed all your life, and you're finished. You barely have some money to survive, and you think about Social Security benefits, all this crap. You're going to have to be a rebel, a rebel with a cause. Look at, look, at, look at Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and Mark Zuckerberg. Three rebels. They went to Harvard. They dropped out. They said, screw this crap. Waste of time. Rebelling. And they all became billionaires. There's nothing wrong in that. There's nothing wrong if your kid doesn't want to go to college and borrow $200,000 to go to college if he has what it takes. It's all in your DNA. You have to become a rebel. A rebel with a cause. Let me tell you something what my father has told me before I came to the United States in 1982. I immigrated. And he told me, I want to give you one advice, which I think is the smartest advice he ever gave me. And I want you to follow this advice very carefully. And you're going to be extremely successful if you do that. And I'm going to share it with you, my dear audience. Because I really want you to all to be really successful and to kick the government's ass and to help me in this mission. Number one, he said, it doesn't matter somebody's origin, color, nationality, gender, where he went to college, Harvard, Wharton, Princeton, who his parents are. It's all crap. Three things matter. And they're all equally important. And if any one of the three things is missing, don't do business with that person. Because sooner or later, you're going to regret it. And I followed his advice. At the beginning, I didn't follow his advice. I didn't pay attention exactly. I was too young and too inexperienced. Then I realized, you know, I started thinking about it with years. I said, you know what? He's so right. My God, it works every time. What are those three ingredients? Number one, guts. Anybody who doesn't have the guts and brass balls to challenge the system, to challenge people, will pull you down with time, will temper you, will bring you down. 
oh, you cannot do this. Oh, it's too much. You don't, you don't want to rock the boat. No, no, you're going to have to rock the boat. You're going to have sometimes to sink the boat and build a new one. That's how much. So anybody without guts, waste of time. Two, equally important, brains. Now, if you have the guts and no brains, you're a loose cannon. <laughs> and if you have the brains and no guts, you're a bureaucrat. There are zillions of them. <laughs> in government, in the business sector, they write papers, they issue reports, they do, it's all crap. They have no guts to do anything. Like people who come and tell me, oh, Ziyad, I'm gonna give you professional advice. I told them, what professional advice? You work for the government or this or that, you make $200,000 a year, which I make in a day. What advice are you gonna give me? So these are bureaucrats. So, I mean, so stay away from that. Three. So, g g uh, you know, uh, guts, brains, and three, passion. Real passion. Compassion to people and passion. Compassion to people, 99% of, of the people on Wall Street will fail. <laughs> because they have no compassion. They're cruel guys. And passion to people. And to what you do. Because nothing, if you have that burning passion, the guts, and the brains, nothing will stop you. You are lethal, unstoppable, to do whatever you want in your life because no one is going to sway you. No one is going to divert you. And you're going to do it whatever it takes, no matter how much you fail, how many times you fail, because you only learn from your failures. You never learn from your successes. This is what this book is all about, economic warfare. I don't want to spend more time on this. I want to give it five more minutes. I really would like to give half an hour for the audience, not 15 minutes. Because usually when I see these things, I have a lot of questions. And I want to make it as interactive as possible with you guys than just making speech. I hate giving speeches, and this is no speech. This is no speech. This is from experience. I'm not an academic, I'm not a professor, I'm not, I'm not only an Apple Gentile, I'm a Wall Street insider. I've been in the trenches for 30 years. And I'm here in this book breaking the code of silence and telling the world how Wall Street thinks, how the government thinks, how the liberals thinks, what are you gonna have to do to outsmart them? Because it is a war. We are experiencing a war. It's a war between the wealth takers, people in the government and others, who think they have a divine right to appropriate and redistribute your wealth, and the wealth creators, the entrepreneurs. It's a war. And business, for me, is war. For a lot of people, business is a hobby. What do we do? Oh, this is what I do for business. I go from nine to five, I do this and that. No, 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 this is war. And you know what is the most important element to win wars? Whether in politics, in the military, in business. And people pay too little attention to this. It's not how much money you have, because you can be taken away in no time. It not, it's not how smart you are. The same thing in the army. Look at the United States. We got our, we got clear, I mean, we really got hurt in Iraq in all the wars we conducted. Lost one trillion dollars, 6,000 lives. The Israelis with Hezbollah lost a lot. No, because they all acted on wrong intelligence. The way you win wars and you win business is by gathering intelligence second to none. How do you gather the intel? Because if it's the right intel and you act upon it, you're gonna be very successful. If it's the wrong intel, with all the money and the power you have, you're gonna get hurt because you're acting on wrong intel. The same thing goes for startups, entrepreneurial companies in Silicon Valley who wanna raise money. They have this model, they think they're so smart because they went to Harvard or because they worked a couple of years for Goldman Sachs or Silicon Valley or things. They think they're so smart, arrogant, hubris, you know, pride, all this crap. And their parents 
told them since they were young they're so special so they're really now so much full of themselves that they are special and they live in a special country special people special all that crap they have they do no homework they gather no intelligence and they get hurt and they get, they go raising 10 20 million this is why so few people make it like a facebook who really these guys are really look at the zuckerberg I'm, I, he didn't pay me anything whatever he should the guy the guy is passionate like hell he gathers all the right intel he has guts like no one and he surround himself with very smart people that's the model this is what you have to do so so gathering the intel is everything unfortunately people make all the wrong decisions by not gathering the intel because they're too lazy because it's too difficult it's too complicated it's easier for me to go through my social <laughs> network and see what this guy or that guy thinks and see what trump or buffett or this guy thinks these are the gods of finance and on business and maybe i should follow the same thing no they have agendas when they tell you this they're manipulating their own agenda and you're falling right into their agenda moron wake up so i mean there's nothing wrong start becoming a rebel a challenger start doing your due diligence start becoming really active to really be able to to get and to amplify this message of Ayn Rand this message of these great players look we can talk as much as we want think about in this room we meet five years from now hopefully we will and you guys have started you know things and now the wealth in this room has multiplied by a hundred your combined wealth think about the power we now have to do what you want to do with the knowledge and experience and wealth creation we have created this is what I like to talk about and do and I put my money where my where my mouth is I don't talk for the sake of talking. I'm not a professor here. I'm not going to... Uh, I, I really want you to understand how this works. By reading this book, I explain to you in detail the tactics you use to create wealth. And it's all about knowledge and understanding of things out there that you don't even think about, that you don't even realize. Uh, I think I've talked for half an hour. I think this is enough. I don't want to be repetitive and bore you with more. Instead of leaving it 50 minutes for the audience for q and I'd like to leave 30 minutes, Alexander, if I may. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the talk. Very inspirational. I. Um see that there are three things that I should be dealing with people that have guts, passion, and brains. And uh, there are many people in the world who maybe are not as expert at any of those three items. Uh, buying your book would be one start, but do you have advice for let, let, let me Yes, let me say something. So uh, it's not being experts at these things. You either have them or you don't. Okay. You know, it's so not that, that. How do you develop them if you identify with, I mean, maybe yourself or your other or friends? Yes. Maybe you don't have them. What, you, if you don't have them, you stick to people who have them, it will rob on you. <laughs> Honestly, you stick to people. I mean, you know, you, you, you know, you're in a discussion, you meet with people, all kinds of people in a, in a social environment, business environment. See, my God, this guy is really impressive. I mean, you know, the way he, you know, yeah, I want to spend more time on this. You see, the thing, the problem with people is that they have a Rolodex. And sometimes they don't want to clean up their Rolodex. They feel comfortable. Everybody likes the comfort zone. So they stick to the same people. There's 7 billion people in the world. So go a little bit outside, you know, the comfort zone. You know, push the envelope a bit. Do you have any stories about your developing any of those qualities yourself through your own experiences? Anything that uh, really drove home the message that you got to push it a little bit harder or you got to have a little more passion yeah i mean look look I, I i network a lot a lot i mean i'm always networking in business social networking off offline networking etc and i meet a lot of people 
I interact with a lot of people. And the more you interact with people, I do business with a lot of people, you know, all kinds of stuff. So the more I do that, I get to really know human nature. Look, at the end of the day, when I back a company, when I build a company, when I finance it, it's all about people. People tell me, Ziad, what do you invest? You invest in this industry or that geography or that location? I don't invest in themes or industries or locations. I back people who are, I mean, for example, if a guy comes in, goes to a Silicon Valley VC, stands on the board, in the boardroom, on the, on, on the table, said, I want to do this and that, they're going to think, think he's crazy. For me, I don't care the style. Everything today is style. What, how you dress, how you look, how you speak. People, it's all sound bites. Attention deficit disorder. People don't pay attention to substance. I read beyond this. I say, what is in this guy's guts? What is in his inside? I'll give you an example. The people I hire at Blackhawk, at my company. Maybe no one in the United States of America hires the people, hires the way I hire people. I'll tell you how. There's only one question I ask people who interview. And if he passes this question, then he goes and talks to my other partners. And you know what this question is? And the way he answers this question determines if I want to move forward or not, and determines for me in, in, in a nanosecond how this guy is. Without seeing this Harvard degrees, I don't give a damn crap about this. I tell him, I ask him, what really upsets you? What, you know, what really upsets you? If the, if the answer is, if the answer is, if he tries to find an answer as to what really upsets him, meaning he's a politically correct guy, he's a guy who will never challenge anything. And anybody who tells me, what the hell is this question? That's my kind of guy. Because he would have challenged me. Anybody who challenges the boss is good for me. Which is exactly the reverse in society. You cannot challenge the boss. I'm the, I'm the boss. No, no, no. I don't want you to challenge me. Because I want to hire people on my team who are going to challenge me. Who are going to challenge a guy who's going to look them in the eye and be extremely intimidating. Can you challenge me? If he challenges me, he's my kind of guy who's got the right view. That's a small example to really to meet, as, as I mentioned to you, Bert. I know this guy now has guts, has brains, and has passion because he has challenged me, and he doesn't care if I'm going to like it or not. One question, which sometimes it takes, going to take some people six times, six months to interview back and forth. I don't have time for this. Next. Guillermo Pineda, uh, I had a question regarding the role of the entrepreneur. Uh, regarding what? The role of an entrepreneur and the way he takes the ethical decisions every time. Uh, all of us that have had at once, at, at least once, a small business and then, then grew it, we reach a point in which we have to take a moral decision either to, are we going to do business with someone or not? And I can imagine, I'm not sure if it has happened to you, that at a certain point you had met this big bureaucrat who made lots of money out of draining the system and then went private and to invest all his money on what he had gained and maybe he proposed you to do business with him. Would you consider like, doing business with someone like that drain uh, got his original money from government as a privilege or maybe he worked for, um, I don't know, he got a monopoly or a small privilege? Would I'm sorry, do I don't understand your question exactly. Would, would you I do consider business? making money? Would I, would I consider making business? Yeah. yeah, would you consider doing business with someone who made his wealth from government or any type of privilege? Well, uh, I mean, number one, uh, anybody I do business with, I checked him out thoroughly. I will even know who his mistress is. Okay. <laughs> that, th that much checking. But would you do business so, with someone? I mean, someone? you know what, at the end of the day, if he does business with the government, if the money is clean, if his uh, background, his ethics is clean, and I will know, I will know. You cannot hide anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, then yes. If not, so it's not a question of the government. There's nothing, you know, the government, sometimes he has access to, uh, you know, big deals, contracts, etc. Yeah, why not? But he has to be 
of the highest integrity. Look, I'll tell you a lot. Uh, look, I, I, I did a lot of very wealthy people, very, very wealthy. And some of them come in here that, and they want to impress you. You know, I'm related to this prince, to this king. I thought, I don't give a sass. You're not going to impress me and dazzle me by telling me this. I want to know who you are. And I want to know if you can challenge these guys, the princes and the kings. And I want to know if these guys are going to listen to you. I need to deal with the powers who can really affect change, move money, and get things done. Not because their title is this and that. I'm not impressed by titles at all. I grew in wealth. I know what it is. But I need to know the character, the integrity, the passion, the, the brains of this guy. And how far can he go? That's what matters. It's people. It's all people. People don't give enough. You know, a lot of the guys, especially in Silicon Valley, they look at the technology. Oh, it's a sexy technology. Oh, it's an industry. Oh, I don't care. I don't care. Who are the people who are going to run the show? Who are the people who are going to stay on board when, when it gets really tough? When the tough gets going? Who are the people who are going to stay on board when there's going to be a major, you know, setback? Can you withstand the heat? Can you withstand the pressure? Are you going to buckle on the pressure or not? Or are you going to say, I'm sorry, there's no sorry. With me, there is no sorry. There's no sorry. There's no, it, 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 there's no excuse for sorry. Because if I'm going to put my money in this, you know what? I, I structure deals whereby if I put my money in the deal, if things go wrong, you are going to hurt much more than I'm going to hurt. You are done. Next. Hi, uh, I'm a 21-year-old from Guatemala as well. I wish and, I was uh, 21. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my question is, um, well, when it comes to raising funds for uh, starting a business, um, I'm sure more in Guatemala than here, it's it's really hard uh, for to get older people to believe in uh, in you being so young and uh, not even out of uh, university. or uh, And we have much more... Um, dogma there or uh, we we um and yeah people investing want to uh, people with mbas and b a bunch of titles and uh, what's the best advice you could give me number one please do me a favor and stop being impressed with people with mbas and all that stuff doesn't mean nothing okay honestly uh so look there is a price to pay for everything. Unless you're a genius or you really have these three ingredients in a lot, you're going to have to go through the process. I do not recommend people to raise money from sophisticated investors until or unless they can show traction in what they can do. So anytime you have a good idea, you're going to have to find ways to bootstrap your business to reach a certain level where you can really show track record traction. Once you can show track record and traction, then you can attract really big bucks to come after you because they believe in you, because you've shown what you can do. So, so you're going to have at the beginning to find a way between friends, families, supporters, you know, angels, you know, as to give you the chance because you have those three ingredients. Show the passion. You see, come in here, show the passion. For example, I don't mind somebody coming to my office. Look, right now, you're sitting in a defense position, like this. No. I don't mind people who come to my office, sit on the boardroom, tell them, listen to me, I want to dominate that space. I want to absolutely rule the space. I want to obliterate the competition, and this is how I'm going to do it. One, two, three, four. Wow. That's the kind of guy. This guy is a killer. People today, because they teach you to conform, you don't want to go with this attitude. You want to conform. You want to be a nice citizen. That's wrong. If you believe that much in your idea, go and kill. Business is war. And show the guy that you really have what it takes to do this, to execute on this. It's contagious. You're gonna, the really smart guys are going to get you. And the guys who are not going to get you, they're not worth it. Drop them. Let them, please, sir. Hey, once you show traction, 
He's not doing you a favor. You're doing him a favor. So don't be on the defensive. You want tactics? Don't be on the defensive. Business is war. Be on the attack, but you only can be on the attack if you have what it takes, if you can have something to back it. Look, when I meet entrepreneurs and CEOs, and I meet a lot of them, if they walk in the door and they tell me they are gods, I tell them, I believe you if you can back it up. Back up that you're God, and I, and I will believe you. But don't tell me you are God and you have done shit. That's greed, arrogance, and stupidity. Get the hell out of my office. Thank you. Hey, um, so you've talked a lot about freedom and wealth. I'm and sorry? You've talked a lot about freedom and wealth. Yes. And guts, brains, and passion as a way to achieve them. I'm curious where happiness is for you. That's happiness. I tell you. For, no, I tell you. I mean, look. First, I mean, you have. I mean, as you can see, I'm a passionate guy. I love what I'm doing. Yeah. I mean, people tell me you're going to retire. Then retire them from what? I'm having a hell of fun. Retire in Florida with blue pants, yellow shirt, and uh, pink tie, and play golf all day long. That's not retirement. <laughs> That's boring for me. <laughs> so, I mean. To come back, to, uh, I will ask you a question. So, I mean, that's, I love what I do. So happiness for me, by doing that, I'm happy. If you're not, I'm, look, I'm not telling you to be like, either you are or you're not. But this is what makes me happy. Because it shows I'm happy, I make people happy, I empower people to be wealthy, to be happy, to empower more people to be the same. It's viral, it's lethal, it's powerful, it's addictive. It is beautiful. If you don't feel this, maybe you should be in different business. But I mean, what is happiness? This is happiness. Happiness is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. for me, what is happiness? This is happiness is what me and my family and my friends are self sustained. They can say whatever we want without fear of anything or anyone because we've become so powerful that no one wants to mess with us. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Ryan Breslow. Nice and to meet you. I'm going into college. And as someone who's really passionate about business and has those, has those uh, attributes that you describe and who knows it and wants to become a Wall Street insider and go work on Wall Street, what advice do you have and what's the path to take coming out of college? Look, it would be, look, you, you have to do your homework. I mean, it, it's, it's a long story, to be honest with you. To be honest with you, I'll you this in a, in, in a way. It, it's a really long story. You really have to do your homework on that. But look, at the end of the day, the way I started on Wall Street, I decided, you know, I was reading this usually investor institutional investor, you know, the magazine, I saw the cover of this guy called Michael Milken, junk bond czar. That's how I started my career, selling and trading junk bonds in Drexel Burnham in Beverly Hills. I said, I want to work for this guy. I read his bio. So in fact, it's not that I want to do this. Go and find a role model on Wall Street and go and unearth every single bit of information you can on him and give him a call. I want to work for you. Why? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Wow. This is my guy. So don't, don't go for institutions. Don't go for walls and buildings and names. And you can find who is this guy out there who's really smart, who really is, has integrity, has character, has a name on Wall Street, is, is making a difference. Go after him. If you go after him, you go to the diligence. Because this guy is a very smart guy. If you don't really know stuff that he doesn't know you know, you're not going to be able to get to him. These guys put walls around them. They have handlers. You can't get to him like that. But you, have, but every, but you can't get to anyone if you do your homework. Wow, this is his Achilles heel. Everybody has an Achilles heel. So find his Achilles heel and go after him. That's the best advice I can give you. Thank you. I've enjoyed your talk. Thank you. I, you're you're quite a cheerleader for business, and you have obvious passion and 
uh, involvement with these, and uh, you really like to cheer us on. Thank you. Um, I've, I've noticed that the left just loves to caricature us as uh, thinking of business as warfare and predatory grasping and destroying people to get our way and that, you know, that's what business is all about. I wonder what you think of the, the idea of, of business as the creation of some great idea and trading value for value to mutual advantage as opposed to warfare. Would you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, I'm not... Business is just about that, absolutely. But you reach on when you reach a certain level. I mean, look, I mean, basically, these guys that you mentioned believe that everything should come through the government. And the government can take care of us better than us of ourselves. We believe otherwise. That's the warfare I'm talking about. It's a warfare. There's no souls. There's, it's much more than it's, it's pretty intense. At the end of the day, who's going to prevail? Today, they are prevailing for sure. So the warfare to which you're referring really is... It's between the wealth takers and the wealth creators. Which okay, I mean. so looters and moochers on one side. Yep. And producers, rah, rah, rah. And what they on, the on the other side, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yes, sir. <clears throat> a couple of things, a statement. I, I don't think your book is out there, but it is for all the people here who have access to the Apple iBook store. It is available there, so I'm letting them know. A little plug for you. But I don't think he's going to be able to autograph your iPad or your, <laughs> or your iPhone. Uh, but aside from that, so I'm looking at the, the contents of your book, and, the, and you had, uh, and I got a couple of part questions. You had Herman Cain and Mark Brown write forwards to your book, and mm -hmm. they're very complimentary. Yep. First question is, why did you choose them? And then second, given the state of the economy in the world today, how are we going to take advantage or, or, or get wealth out of the collapse of the European Union, the euro, and what should we do in the United States to preserve our wealth? Three-part question. Okay, stay there. <laughs> All right, number one question, why Mark Rowan and Herman Cain? Mark Rowan was my classmate at the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, was my uh, um, colleague at Drexel Burnham. Mark Rowan is... Uh, a self-made entrepreneur. When he came to the Wharton School, we graduated the same year in 1984. He went there on scholarship, so he, didn't, he could not pay his tuition. Today, Mark Rowan is, less, is worth $1.9 billion. He's 48 years old. He created $1.9 billion in 25 years. He's one of my best friends. So, I've known him since college, since Drexel, on Wall Street, self-made billionaire, very humble, greatest integrity. Why not? And today, Mark Rowan runs Apollo, which he's a chief investment officer of Apollo Power Partners, is the largest private equity fund in the United States. He runs himself $128 billion. So what more? So if anybody from the Wall Street establishment is going to say, who the hell is this immigrant who's coming here to challenge the Wall Street establishment? Well, if I have Mark Rowan, who owns the largest private equity fund, who's driving my forward, I have Wall Street now. Shut up. Yeah, they're in your palm. He's, and he does good work for you. Okay. Two, Herman Cain. Well, I, spend, I send my book, you know, guts, to every single candidate, presidential candidate, on the Republican side. I'm writing this book. This is going to open up a lot of things for you. So don't think you're doing me a favor. I'm doing you a favor by having you write my forward. Write my forward. Herman Cain was the first one to respond. He said, I love it. This is brilliant. And he wrote the forward. 
He's passionate. He's passionate. Exactly, exactly what you said. He's passionate. He understands it. I don't care. He's black. He's pink. He's this. He's that. He is smart. He knew how to do it, and he was very passionate about it. Did the other candidates come through with any kind of anything else? Uh, I got a I got a yes from Ron Paul, but he was a bit slower, so I would have to wait a lot to get from Ron Paul, and I, and I was willing to wait. But you know, then he got tangled in the you know the primaries, and you know you know it, it, it wasn't the best time it was. But it was when I did this was July August 2011, so they were really still in the middle of it all. But uh, I mean, look, I mean they're all good. I mean they're really all good. So I would have taken it from any one of them. But Herman Cain came very quickly, so that's why. So I said, you know, since this book, Economic Warfare, is about both the business world and the political world, I said I need a, a, a two for forwards, one from the business world, one from the political world. Herman Cain was a presidential candidate, uh, Mark Rowan, part of the business establishment, and the third one who wrote my introduction, Doug Weed, who was a presidential advisor to Reagan, Bush one, and Bush two. He was advisor to Reagan, Bush one, Bush two, and he wrote my introduction. So anybody now who's going to come and challenge me and put bullets into my ammunitions as to who are you, now I revert to him. Who the hell are you? That's it. Second question. Uh, remind me of your second question, please. European. European e Union. Well, Euro European, Europe, 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 Europe is in a mess and it's going to get more in a mess and China's growth is going to get less, it's going to definitely affect us. The economy is going to get worse and worse. Don't believe any of this crap you see, you listen to. Stock market is uh, manipulated. Everything is manipulated by the Fed. You know, They're going to do everything they can to re-elect Obama. They're going to use every ammunition in their, uh, in, their, uh, in their artillery. It's not going to work because it's going to get so bad that any president will win over Obama. So Europe, I'm very pessimistic. But you know what? It doesn't mean, but you know what? Optimistic, pessimistic doesn't mean it. You have to gather the intel. But based on the intel, even if Europe goes into destruction, you can still make obscene money if you know what you're doing. Whatever the side the market takes, up or down, right or left, you can make obscene money if you understand the markets. If you're a contrarian, you're, oh, I'm going to lose. Yeah, the regular people who don't do any information, who rely on the big boys, are going to lose their money. But not you as the savvy operator who understands this. So it should not worry you if you have the equipment, if you have gathered the intel, if you have the baggage that I told you about. It shouldn't worry you. So what? Even if the whole world goes upside down, there's always ways of making money. You go short, you go long, you go dollar, you go yen, you go US dollar, you go gold, you go oil. So many ways of skinning the cat. Your third question? Was what do we do in the United States as we get to this crash that we're coming? Well, number one, coming? number one, number one, anybody here, I'm not, I'm not here recommending, forget about stocks, forget about bonds, forget about real estate for at least two, three years. Forget about it. Forget about all this crap. The only way to be is in the commodities business. Oil and gold bullion. The only business to be. I talk about it at length in my book, at length. That's why I take a look at it. I can't explain, it's, it's too, too long, you know, it's too long to explain. But forget about stocks and bonds and real estate. Real estate is not gonna recover soon. Stocks and bonds, it's all, it's just all manipulation. Look, $16 trillion in debt, the dollar has, de has devaluated 96%, you know, our position in the world, our economy, our, I mean, it's, it's, you know, look, look at you, you heard a couple of days ago, JP Morgan's losses, not 2 billion, 9 billion, you know, 9 billion. So everything they tell you is sanitized, it's sanitized crap. Don't believe anything of this. Do your homework and take your positions accordingly. And sometimes you have to be a contrarian and be against all what people say, just do it. Just do it. If you have the right intel, yes, you can be right and a billion people wrong. Yes, you can. Or oh, it's impossible, everybody thinks that. But people, because they don't have enough faith in themselves and their intelligence, that they don't believe that they can be right and a billion people long, uh, wrong. Yes, a billion people can be wrong, and more even. And you can be right. If you have faith. All right, I want to th thank Ziad for the
non-speech and the conversation. And thank everybody for coming. And the next session start in 15 minutes.